Hi everybody and welcome to our fourth video for Unit 4 of AP US History, Expansion, Regionalism, and Reform from 1800 to 1848. In this video, we're going to move into economics. We've been talking about, uh, we've been very politics heavy for the last couple of videos. So we're going to move into economics in particular for the next two videos. In this video, we'll be exploring topic 4.5, the market revolution industrialization. So let's get started. Okay, let's start with the big question. How did the nature of the U.S. economy change during the antebellum period? And if you're not sure where the antebellum period is, we're referring to this period shortly before the Civil War, about circa 1815 to about 1860. Okay, so... Before the market revolution, at the start of the 19th century, right at the turn of that 19th century, um, here's what the U.S. economy looked like. The United States was a subsistence economy, mostly made up of scattered farms, small workshops, spaced out villages and smaller towns for the most part. And it was subsistence insofar people were mostly creating the things they needed to subsist, to survive, to live. Most households functioned essentially as self-sufficient economic units. They spun their own wool, they made candles, they grew their own food, and what things they couldn't make at home, they often, typically, would barter for with their neighbors for the kind of things that they just couldn't make themselves for their neighbors, or maybe, I don't know, grow or trade locally. So pretty, um, in terms of regionally, uh, the economically, the U.S. was still pretty divided. Goods were going to be sold mostly locally. If you drew, grew some extra crops, let's say for sale at the market, it's going to be probably your local market. Or in some cases, especially in areas that are near waterways, ports, um, along rivers, uh, they're going to be selling maybe to some international customers using those ports and waterways because Overland travel was difficult and dangerous and expensive. You may recall in one of the previous videos, I talked a little bit about how the War of 1812 really revealed how weak and poor the infrastructure of the United States was. It just didn't have good roadways. So um, the Old Northwest, which would be that kind of Northwest territory we got out of the uh, Revolutionary War, that Ohio River Valley, it was barely settled in 1800 and it was reliant, heavily reliant, on the Mississippi River to transport the grains they grew down to the south or to New Orleans for sales. In other words, the U.S. still very much had colonial vestiges. It looked a lot like it did when it was colonies, and it also looked very much like Thomas Jefferson's ideal of this agrarian economy made up of small yeoman farming households. Okay, so how did this change? And you probably already have an idea about this, especially if you took AP World History last year. Okay, so the market revolution occurs in the early 19th century. Now, I know you know most likely about industrialization from previous classes, right? Our first wave of early industrialization occurs in the early 19th century in the United States. And we are going to talk a little bit about that first wave of industrialization in this video. What you may not know as much about is the market revolution. Beginning in this antebellum period, the U.S. is going to experience profound economic shifts. And you need to know what the market revolution is. For the U.S., the market revolution was the linking of northern industries to western and southern farms. And this happened very specifically because there were big advances in agriculture, in industry, right, technology, and transportation. And a lot of legislation um, and judicial decisions that really uh, furthered these changes. So in the market revolution, we're going to start to see in this early 19th century, individuals who had been on these self-sustaining farms are going to scatter and start working in mills for wages. Um, or maybe if they stay in their household farms, they're going to plant maybe only one or two specific types of crops to sell at market um, to buy goods. So instead of just planting crops to feed themselves, they might just plant a couple crops, especially cash crops, to sell at the market to buy goods. So store-bought goods like fabric and soak and candles are going to replace homemade products. Industry is going to become increasingly coordinated within the U.S., um, and it's going to knit together different regions and create interdependence in these regions. And this interdependence is really going to mean that uh, the different regions of the United States depend on each other for as markets, okay, to buy and sell goods. Uh, the old Northwest that we talked about starts to become closely tied to the northern states thanks to new transportation technology. 
And increasingly, we're seeing uh, more wealth, more prosperity, uh, unfortunately, more economic inequality as well. We're going to see the development both of millionaires, okay? Uh, John Jacob Astor, for example, with his fur empire, is going to die in the 1840s and leave behind an astonishing $30 million, okay? So we're going to see the growth of millionaires, but also the growth of a really large, unskilled wage laboring class that that lives really on a pittance. And again, you're probably going to be familiar with a lot of these themes from previous classes. Okay, so let's talk about the legislative and judicial systems that supported these economic changes. And we'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about the functionality of what actually causes this change. But let's start by talking about what allows for these changes to take place in the first place in terms of the legislative branch and the judicial branch. What is, what is the government doing to support this change? So Okay, so let's start with the Marshall Court, which he talked about in the uh, previous couple videos. The Marshall Court had actually really ardently supported contract rights, uh, which are essentially said that states had to grant irrevocable charters, uh, essentially monopolies. Uh, to certain private businesses and companies. Okay, these charters limited competition and, like I said, allowed monopolies to develop really easily. Okay, so John Marshall dies in 1835 and Chief Justice Roger Taney takes over and things are going to change a lot. Okay, in several different court cases, Roger Taney is going to argue that the rights of the community far outweigh private corporate interests, essentially ruling against these charter rights and allowing new businesses to open in competition. So this allows economic opportunity, more economic competition, more places making more goods, refining goods, making them cheaper. So this is really going to increase uh, economic growth. Other factories, excuse me, factors, uh, state incorporation laws are going to shift. The laws which allow corporations and companies to form are going to change. Uh, they're going to grant investors so-called limited liability. Uh, so essentially, if their companies, uh, if the companies of individual investors were sued um, or went bankrupt, those individual investors had limited liabilities. That meant they were risking the shares of stock that they owned, but not their own personal wealth. If someone sued their company, they couldn't take their homes and any other items they own. This is really going to encourage more people to create companies and invest, right? Because there was less risk to do so. Uh, the development of patent laws is also going to be really important. Patent laws protected ownership rights of inventors, which meant that you could invent something and, you know, profit from it. This creates an environment that really motivated people financially to create labor-saving inventions. And then finally, protective tariffs, a series of protective tariffs passed in the 1810s, 20s, and 30s are going to make imported goods much more expensive, and they're going to promote the production and sale of domestic or American goods. These are all going to really create the sort of perfect storm that allows for a lot of these economic changes to occur. Okay, so what were the actual changes in technology that accompanied, or uh, rather that spurred the market revolution? Okay, so start with industrial technology. I already mentioned the patent laws that uh, motivated people to create these labor-saving inventions. Eli Whitney's a pretty um, familiar name. You may recall when we talked about the invention of the cotton gin in the previous unit. Eli Whitney also invented interchangeable parts, which was first applied to guns. Interchangeable parts were essentially parts that were machine-made and absolutely identical to each other, okay? And this is really significant because pr prior to this, manufacturing was completely different. All manufacturers' good were made, goods were made start to finish by a single person who was highly skilled, for example, a gunsmith. Now, this is a very long process. Um, one mistake on, and on the good, like the weapon, for example, it might need to be scrapped entirely. Um, if you have one thing break on your rifle, it may not work anymore. However, if you machine a weapon in different pieces with precision and machine them in bulk, then you can assemble all the pieces. And then if any part breaks, you don't have to replace the whole thing. You just need to replace that individual part. Okay, so this is this is enormous. This is hugely significant. The application of this technique to industry causes industrialization to really take off. And again, this starts with guns, but obviously goes well beyond that. Other notable inventions, the labor saving devices, a sewing machine invented by Elias Howe and then perfected by Isaac Singer is definitely going to help the textile industry or the ready-made clothes industry take off. And this is really going to happen in the 1850s, right before the start of the Civil War. And we're going to first see this really with um, Civil War 
uniforms, especially. Uh, the telegraph will revolutionize communication. Samuel Morse will invent the telegraph in the 1840s and allow for instant communication across long distances. And again, I know we are used to instant uh, communication, but can you imagine the revolution in not having to wait a week or two for a reply to a letter, but instantly knowing the information or the news from someone that's hundreds of miles distant. This is huge. And then of course, vulcanized rubber is another big one that for use in um, tires and wheels or tires rather, uh, vulcanized rubber, the vulcanization process invented by Charles Goodyear, who you probably will know is the Goodyear tire brand. Okay, so now we see also the introduction of the factory systems. Um, and this is really a shift of where goods are being produced. Like I said, they're no longer being produced at homes or in small workshops. They begin to be produced um, in, um, in, in factories by machines. Uh, they're assembled by unskilled laborers and then shipped out to other markets. And this means the US is flooded with inexp inexpensive manufactured goods to buy. The abundant water power of New England really makes it a center for manufacturing. Uh, early factories were powered by running water. And to find cheap factory labor, textile mills are going to start to recruit young farm women and house them right there in the factory in company dormitories. This was called the Lowell system, named by the first uh, uh, factory or mill that did this in 1814, um, the Lowell Mill, which you can see pictured up here in the right. Um, this is going to be coppered by other industries, and they're also going to use child labor and later on immigrant labor. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the agricultural changes and technology we're seeing as well. So I already kind of mentioned the cotton gin, which is also created by Eli Whitney. This significantly sped up the process of separating cotton seeds from um, cotton fibers. So uh, the spinning machine, another invention, turned cotton into yarn. And this really transformed Southern agriculture, uh, the cotton gin, which can now ship cotton at this crazy unprecedented rate uh, due to really high demand from Britain and also from the Northeast and textile mills there. So this is also going to definitely increase the reliance of the South on slave labor because now they could turn, you know, cotton into yarn at such a fast rate, um, or rather they could turn, uh, they could clean cotton at such a quick rate that essentially as much cotton as they could put under cultivation, they could clean and then sell. Uh, this is a shift in farming styles, which I already kind of hinted at in the early 1800s. Again, you have subsistence farming, you're farming to feed yourself, maybe just a little extra to sell locally. But now we start to see commercial farming practices replacing subsistence farming in the 19th century. This is a focus on growing cash crops, cotton or tobacco, especially in the South. This is not for survival, but for trade at both local markets and distant markets. And as I said, because of this high demand from the British market, this is going to link the South in the US, not only to the North, but to international industry. And a few other inventions that are really going to spur the shift were like the steel plow invented by John Deere and the McCormick Mechanical Reaper. Okay, so let's talk about transportation changes, changes in transportation that spurred the market revolution. So the need for a reliable and efficient way to move all these raw materials and manufactured goods um, is going to be uh, necessary. So turnpikes, toll roads, create financial incentives for companies to build highways. Uh, some challenges were that the Northeast complained that roads encouraged a drain on their population to the West. Uh, states' rights advocates decried any kind of federal involvement, saying, no, no, the federal government cannot fund any of these roads. And then states overall were wary of taking responsibility for a federal role road that went beyond their borders. Okay, and this is really going to shift with the building of the National Road or the Cumberland Road, which connected Maryland on the East Coast to Illinois. This is a thousand miles, all hard paved. Okay, so a lot of roads are going to be built. Um, around the same time, there's a big push and boom in building turnpikes. We're also going to see a boom in building canals. These are human constructed rivers that connect waterways, that connect two different rivers. The Erie Canal is going to be the largest one built in New York in 1825. It links Western farms with East Coast manufacturing, and it spurred the growth of a lot of other canals. The steamboat, of course, is going to be really vital for this, uh, invented by Robert Fulton. This is going to increase trade efficiency by allowing boats to travel both down the river and up the river against the current. And you can see this image of all the canals and navigable rivers and waterways that existed in the 1850s. 
Okay, in addition to this, of course, the railroad is going to be the superstar. In the 1850s, we're going to really see this take off. Um, but even by 1820s and 1830s, it starts to become the main technology to transport goods. Um, governments, both local governments and state governments, are going to grant loans, tax breaks, and even land to railroad companies to build their railroads. And then by 1860, 30,000 miles of track had been laid. And you will notice that track is mostly in the Northeast. There is a huge amount of railroad track in the Northeast uh, in the 1850s and uh, up to 1860. Okay, so a lot of that transportation is happening in the Northeast to move manufactured goods and raw materials. Okay, so that is it for our technology video today. Uh, we're going to be looking a little bit more about the market revolution um, in our next video, and especially in terms of its impact on society and culture. So stay tuned for next time.